Hello everyone uh, and welcome to the first webinar of World Screens Emerging Talent Month. Uh, I'm Georgia, I'm the World Screens Outreach and Sustainability Coordinator uh, and I've been helping World Screens deliver our Emerging Talent Programme over the last year. So in today's session we are going to be discussing the power uh, of telling natural world stories and how they can inspire, empower, engage young audiences not only with nature but with the wider conversation about the future of our planet's health and the health of the world's biodiversity and climate. Uh, we're also going to be discussing how storytelling for younger audiences differs from stories aimed at the wider public and be getting some tips and tricks for creating your own. Uh, there will be a short Q&A at the end of the webinar so if you have any questions feel free to pop them uh, in the Q&A box which is just down at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I am thrilled to be joined by our three wonderful speakers. I'm hoping it will be three <laughs> very shortly. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Firstly, we will very shortly have Ash Kapoor, who is a science communicator and award-winning natural history filmmaker. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Darwood Qureshi, a queer writer, wildlife filmmaker, journalist and researcher at BBC Natural History Unit. And finally, we have Dan O'Neill, who is a wildlife television presenter, film director, zoologist, creative producer, and LGBTQIA plus activist. Welcome all. Hello. Thank you so much for Lovely joining to us to talk here. about how natural world storytelling can be tailored to motivate younger audiences and engage with nature. How are you both doing? Very good. All happy. Yeah, no, I think it's really, really sunny here in Bristol. So it's beautiful weather um i have not been outside yet which i'm a bit sad about but <laughs> mm. i would nice. to give a beautiful view but we've got all of our washing out actually i don't care look at that <laughs> it is it is lovely it looked like it was going to be a bit gray this morning but um mm -hmm. the sun won in that fight which we're thankful for um so lara my tech wizard is just trying to get ash back online so i think if we kick off then she'll be able to join us. So Ash's out on a recce. Um, <laughs> I think it, just as we were about to join, um, the rain and the storm that was outside wherever Ash was, was starting to get very, very heavy and she was holding her uh, headphones in. So I'm sure this is probably that rain that's just knocked the aerial off the top of her head. Yeah, it's doing something to the Wi-Fi for sure. Hopefully she'll be able to get back online as soon as possible. It's quite a cool reason to not yeah, be on the isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. So um, I think it's best to start off with the, the broader picture about this conversation. Uh, we all know, and I'm sure we can all agree, that engaging and inspiring the younger generation and the next generations with nature is critical for the future of our planet and the health of the natural world. But how does wildlife film and photography fit into this and what makes it such a good tool for doing that? Well, I think first off, one of the most I th overlooked things is like we never really realised until this point just how important that, well, I think we have, but like it's really been put to the forefront of the conversation, just how important storytelling for younger audiences is. Um, because I think a lot of us who are wildlife filmmakers involved in conservation, involved in sustainability, we kind of cut our teeth in that, in that journey through engaging with programmes when we were kids. Ash is back. Woo! You're muted, by the way. Ash. Um, I'm so sorry. This is I'm so sorry. Middle of the middle of the hills and it's raining really, really heavily. So if my internet dies. It's a great reason. No, you're right. Um, but no, we were just uh, beginning on the first question, Ash, about um sure. it's important to have uh conversations around uh well, this conversation around younger audiences, especially and how important that is. No, but I think, yeah, it is. I mean. I was just at Steve Backshall's show, um, the Ocean show, at the um, the other day, and it was um, incredible how knowledgeable the kids were. They knew every answer to every question, and these are like some of them were like quite complicated questions. Some of them were like really obscure species, and these kids that some some as young as six years old know the audio, know the answers already. So I think, from my perspective, and what I even learned more there is to not underestimate what kids 
know and what they've already learned and to not be condescending in the storytelling and actually to like allow them to really engage with it in that way because they really want it and it's and it seems like kids are really hungry it really it's really um i think really really cool to see how kids learn Mm. um especially from all of the wildlife films that come out and all of the documentaries so i remember um when i was um a lot younger the only films we would watch would be david attenborough documentaries and loads and those stacks upon stacks of wildlife documentaries and that's all we'd have and we'd have them all like in a case and that's like all we would watch because we didn't have a tv um growing up and so we just consume that mm. and even for kids who don't watch um solely wildlife documentaries um like nerdy little me um you know they can learn so much from all of these wildlife documentaries and films that come out and like you were saying dan i think sometimes it's it's undervalued how powerful a tool yeah. movie making is and films because it is really it's incredibly powerful people have their entire perspectives changed by simply watching one documentary they can learn so much from watching one film and whilst I always say you know reading is really cool reading is really good um but any sort of ingestion of information information in a way that basically make someone passionate about the subject they're being yeah. informed about that's you know that's what you need to focus on and I think there does need to be more of a focus on filmmaking um as a really strong communicative tool because it is it's just so powerful and especially with wildlife and conservation where you know I think when I started off we would lean very heavily um on leaflets or writing or journals and that sort of thing. And if you do lean on that, that's that's all very well and good, but it means you cut out a lot of the population that aren't just aren't gonna respond to that sort of communication. Mm. But, absolutely, I think the, I think, I mean, I completely echo what you're saying because I think the key word here is inspiration because when to become a conservationist or a champion of nature, that comes from a very deep space of inspiration and that's not something that can be preached and it can't be something that is demanded of somebody it's something that's inspired and the best time to inspire people is when they're young when they're when they're at that age when they can really be sort of molded and shaped and that's where i have personally felt that conservation i mean nature films have been such an effective tool because it helps really sort of bridge that gap between education and i mean awareness and inspiration and i really don't think that awareness is as much of a problem anymore really that's not so much of an issue because a lot of people are very aware now of the of the of the issues the environmental issues where the, the gap is i think awareness is less of a problem indifference is more of a problem mm -hmm. and when you have to turn uh, when you have to turn sort of indifference into involvement that's where inspiration comes in and i think that's where audiovisual content nature films can really sort of make that difference mm. um yeah, because it's so something... true, isn't it? When you're a kid and you like you, that those like formative years of where you decide yeah, exactly. kind of what you care most about in the world and what you go into class and become that. Because every kid had that, right? I don't know if you guys yeah. all had this, but when you were like the one in the classroom that they called on when a bird got trapped in 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 the room, and you were the one that like yeah. saved it and got rid of it, or if, it wasn't if, dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't dead. Uh, but I think like <laughs> those things. That are so and following on from what you were saying, Ash, I think another thing that like is so different is back then. You know, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily quite so mainstream to care about sustainability and care about the environment. But I think what changes us now is we're in a position where, like, we've now realized, you know, so many more people than back when we were kids are living in cities and are outside of nature, you know, and I think that's more of an inspiration that we have to work towards now. We've got to get get it. So in the changing global society that we live in and the changing in access to nature that people have and the privileges that they have how do we get, how do we get that across to everybody um and i think that's what's really exciting about working on projects recently what well what you have done um on planet defenders recently ash and what uh dalwood and i did with the queer community with cr future it's really exciting to be gain, gaining kind of insight into new audiences which i think is a way this industry is going that it doesn't seem that it has done in the past which is so mm -hmm. exciting yeah, I think, and I also want to pick up on the yeah. point about indifference as opposed to awareness, um, because I think that is a really, that's a really important thing that we kind of need to focus on 
especially as we go into this new era of everything being shown on screen all the time, because, you know, like you said, there are documentaries oh. basically everything at the moment. And there's, you know, there's documentaries on all sorts of wildlife and all sorts of conservation processes at the moment. But um, that means that everyone's aware of everything all the time. Yeah. And that means that it can get normalized. And the problems exactly. that happen in a lot of the world, especially with a lot of wildlife and people, um, that gets normalized. And that's where this idea of intersectionality comes in, which is what, you know, me and Dan were working on, um, especially with the CR Future project. It's, it's really this idea that we're moving into an era where people know things and, you know, kids know everything. And, you know, you can learn things simply by searching stuff up. But whether or not you know enough to the point at which you know how to do things about it, as opposed to just being aware that it exists, that's probably where we need to focus more of our efforts. And I think as, you know, again, I would I would um, focus on projects like the CR Future Project, not just because I was in it, but because it was um, quite useful, I think, in that it didn't just offer this perspective whereupon people would learn about the subject, but it also offered advice and it also offered you know people who were doing things at that very moment and are doing things right now about some of the issues that were told that were talked about in the documentary and I think you know even with the planet defenders project um, um especially with that actually and with other films and documentaries that are coming out that's what the focus has to be more on it's how can we get everyone else involved and it doesn't just become this gem of a documentary that sits there and is watched by many and no one really understands what to do about those issues but that what you're saying is just so valid because I've used Fat Planet Defenders as sort of like an excuse almost to have like lots of school talks and stuff as well. And what you're saying is something that the kids themselves ask me all the time. They all the time want to know this. They actually ask the hard questions. It's not like we present like I'm offering them the difficult, uh, the difficult uh, facts. They are asking me the hard questions. Mm -hmm. They want to know the truth and they want to know what to do about it. So this is actually coming straight from the audience. To, this is in my personal experience, because actually the audience that Planet Defenders is for and kid, kiddie audience, we don't see them online. Mm -hmm. So we don't get to engage with them the same way that we would with, you know, adult and young audiences that are older. So that audience, you have a, only have a direct interaction with when you're doing school talks and direct interactions. And it was amazing because the one question that kept repeating itself over and over and over again is what can I do? What can we do? What can mm -hmm. we do better? What else can we do? What else can we do? And if we are sitting all the way in London, can we do something about the Gibbons all the way in India? So what you're saying is the question that's coming straight from the young audiences. And I can completely vouch for that. Mm. And it's so in it's so interesting, even just hearing you yeah. talk about that, because I, I work in development, or at least when I joined the industry, my main job was working in development and developing ideas. And the question that I, the comment that would get asked so much would be that commissioners don't oh there's too much conservation or like how do we pull that back a bit and don't have too much conservation in it but talking about the difference between kids tv and adults tv maybe the adults like they don't want to hear all of those things but kids want to know now because it's the it, it's been so obvious in the last couple of years four or five years that kids are annoyed and they want yeah. the planet to be fixed and they want yes. to know how to fix it. And I think that's what is critically important to involve now in all conversations around kids TV is like, give them the art, give them the tools, give them the tools, mm -hmm. um, which is totally different to kind of what the commissioning landscape was like for adults at least five, 10 years ago. I've, I've often, um, sorry, I've, I've often found, uh, just a small thing to add on if we need to move on, but um, I've often found, I think that, with kids TV, a lot of the time, um, especially with wildlife kids TV, um, the more important messages can actually be snuck into those shows way more easily than they can be done um, in adult um, documentaries or documentaries that are primarily for older audiences. Because with older audiences, you, um, you're kind of targeting audiences specifically for specific qualities that they want to watch out for. But with kids, you can basically put, you know, you can put such important messages in there because they'll just take it in and they won't really care about it. And I think this is really interesting because um, when I worked um, in development um, at the BBC, we were talking about the Green Planet and, you know, the, the kind of the effects of that incredible documentary and what, um, what kind of people would be watching it. And I heard a lot of people talking about how their tiny young kids were watching this documentary and were enjoying it and sitting through the entire thing. And no one could believe the fact that these young kids were sitting through a long documentary on plants and you know you, yeah. you underestimate us you underestimate you know 
um, people when you do that because you underestimate how important and how interested people will be in the natural world. And that's because you're coming from the perspective of an older person, um, potentially, or a person who isn't from a certain minority or someone who isn't from a certain background. And that's, you know, bringing it right back round to perspective and awareness because uh, you're, you're talking about green planet i'm sorry i think i missed that you're talking about green planet oh yeah no i was just saying yeah. that basically with the green planet it was you know it's an incredible documentary and certain yeah. people who they never thought would have watched it watched it and learned a lot from it and it's this idea that you know the people who are who make the program should be the people who are watching them because then you oh. better understand um how to reach everyone yeah, and I, I love it yeah, when absolutely. those kind of documentaries can like transcend generations, even mm -hmm. if they're made for a specific audience. You're so right in that yeah. kids connect with the, the facts and the amazingness of nature in a way that adults don't. So talking about like specifically uh, these films or photographs, whatever it may be, for a younger audience, what is the main difference between working on a project aimed at younger audiences compared to one aimed at a wider and more general audience? Do you approach it in a different way? Is there a different format? Um, yeah, Ash, do you wanna? Oh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a couple of things I'd like to say that, um, I mean, the first thing that actually comes to mind is that is the conservation content is the amount of conservation content now in kiddie shows now you may think that that would be less but in fact it's probably much much more than in adult in adult content because actually um most of the industry still is very much packaging content for adults in a way that is still very much escapist entertainment whereas for the for the younger audiences, that's not what they exactly want, exactly what we were talking about a while ago, which is that they are wanting to hear the real story, the full picture. They want to hear the environmental problems. Of course, they want to see the lovely animal stories and behavior stuff, but they also really want to want conservation content. So I think that's one thing that I don't shy away from at all in anything that I'm making for a younger audience is that um, uh, you, I mean, you, you would actually say that these are the issues with what we're talking about. And of course, you find a way of showing that there is hope and there's amazing work happening in this field so that you can inspire that that sort of you can inspire this young audience to also want to join that movement that's one and the other thing i think which i love about working uh, with a young audience and this is something you should do with older audiences as well really but it's just you can be yourself you can just totally be yourself you can goof around and you can just have a camera and they don't really mind if you're you've got a wobbly shot or what's going on but you just need to be yourself and uh, that's something i really enjoyed doing on planet defenders because so much of it was self-shot and it wasn't staged, it wasn't presentary, uh, because, oh my God, I would totally have messed that up because, you know, you can't just be natural. And I think kids love that. Kids love it when your normal, natural personality sort of just comes out and you engage with them like you would uh, in real life. So um, it takes that pressure off completely and you can just goof around and share what you know and just be passionate and just sort of be yourself. On Planet Defenders, I'll just add to that because it is just a fantastic show and anybody who hasn't watched it, who is interested in making content for kids or is interested in learning more about it, it is it's a series of um, films kind of self-filmed and self-produced by filmmakers who are young themselves all over the world in their own homes that was made during lockdown and it like it's really really like it doesn't there's no condescending element to it there's no element that makes you think that that content couldn't be for kids like your episode um ashwika and malaika's as well I, i'm and, and, and in fact all of them erin's brilliant megan's fantastic they didn't have an L, and, and jack's as well i mean they all have their own kind of way of not making the kids feel like it's uh they're any different i'm megan took a piece of um, uh, rock salmon, which turns out to be a shark species, to a lab, and it's quite serious. And, and you know, Malika went undercover um, and, and some quite serious stuff. So I think, like, it's a really good, it's a really good show to see how um, not being condescending and showing slightly harder topics can actually work really well for kids because you know, kids are. It, 
we don't have the they don't have the wool over their eyes anymore you know the world's a really difficult place social yeah. media and the internet has given so much bigger access to bigger topics and harder topics to kids and yeah i think it did that a really fantastic job all of you in that you. Show. really brilliant i think as well there is um something that i learned which was interesting to learn but i think when doing um, any sort of kids television or kids media around wildlife and conservation because before I've created like um, I've created information packs for schools on conservation work and marine biology and then um, not too recently I guess but um, recently sort of um, I did um, CBBS um, and talked about starfish and it's really interesting when you do that kind of work and you work out how to make the structure of the program and what you're going to talk about, you actually understand that you're learning how to create content, not just for kids, but for everyone in order that they understand it. And then you kind of get an idea of how grossly overcomplicated STEM is and how grossly <laughs> overcomplicated wildlife <laughs> and conservation is. You know, it's just, it's so presented. <laughs> It's presented in such an overly yeah. complicated way. You know, there'll be words that are used that don't need to be used, or there'll be language. Um, there was entire paragraphs I remember um, when we were doing the CBB show where I'd sort of I'd say things and I talk about I talk about things like species, or I talk about um, animals with Latin names, or I talk about this and that, and they would say, you know, you can't do that because people are not really going to understand what you're talking about. And for me, that was actually a moment where I thought, actually you know, my degree has meant that I'm now communicating to people about these subjects that everyone should know about in a way that not everyone's going to understand. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of understand more about accessibility and you understand more that if everyone needs to learn about wildlife and conservation, you need to make these things more accessible because not everyone's going to be doing a degree in it. Not everyone's going to be learning about certain subjects in a certain language. And why should they? Why should they have to learn about these subjects in this way? You know, I'm we're often told, I think, especially in STEM, that it's useful because it's a way of categorizing or it's, you know, it's something to do with how you've learned this subject. But the only reason that it's helpful yeah, it's to learn about these subjects in that way is because it's taught in that way and because it's been taught in that way for many, many years. And yeah. so really it's kind of its own circle and it doesn't really span, it doesn't really um, sort of spawn anything useful for the wider public or a wider audience. And it's the reason people feel so disconnected to science and especially to wildlife and nature, especially in the UK, is because it's not accessible. It's not an accessible subject for a lot of people. And so I think what kids programs do, which is really useful, is they present it in a way that it is accessible. And I, a lot of people contacted me afterwards who weren't kids um, and just said <laughs> they watched it and they learned tons about starfish literally because they just. I've had it. a few confessions as well from people. So, but that's so cool. And I remember I've watched a lot of programs. Yeah. <laughs> I've watched a lot of programs, um, kids' that's programs so cool. about wildlife, and you learn so much. And I love CBB. That's great. <laughs> It's awesome. Yeah. And it's a good so, test, actually, isn't it? Kind of if you if an adult yeah. likes it, it's probably a good kids show. When I watched Steve <laughs> the other day on stage, it was all these kids in the audience having the best time of their life. And I was like, this is amazing. I was like, shouting <laughs> all these names out. I was losing to the kids and I was like getting a bit competitive with them. <laughs> but I'm supposed to know this. Stop outshining me. And I think I think you've all mentioned that kids nowadays are way more tapped into this conversation. Does the the kind of where and the the fact that the this kind of content is far more accessible because of youtube and TikTok, you know kids are engaging on those platforms with this type these type of stories um do you have an experience with that is it an approachable way for emerging talent or new storytellers to get involved and is it a great way to connect these stories with the people that you're you know the kids that you're trying to reach i've never downloaded TikTok in my whole life um, you need to have eyes, so I'm going to keep quiet. I think, I know, that that was, that was, that was, this is a valid question. But YouTube-wise, I mean, I run a film festival, um, uh, a touring one, and all of the films that we get submitted pretty much are films that were made for people to get into the industry or to upload onto YouTube channels. And loads of that content is like, you know, devoured by younger generations because that's what so much of the that's what so much of the audience of those platforms is um and i think is absolutely a vital um 
vitally important way of people getting engaged and getting more um, into storytelling themselves. Because like, I mean, my my first short film that I made was kind of how I learned how to make a film. I didn't know, I didn't, before I did a master's here in Bristol um, in wildlife filmmaking at UWE. Um, and I, before I joined that master's, I pretty much had never edited anything. I didn't know how to use Premiere. I didn't know how to shoot. I didn't know how to do anything. I learned all of it on that, partly by my flatmate Gail Kukula, um, learned how to do it. So, and, and then, and it was actually making YouTube videos and stuff uh, for Instagram that I learned how to do the stuff that I'm doing today. So I think it is really important you can get conservation messages much more easily out there through that platform because you're making it for your own audience or your yeah. people around you and also your own learning experience, not like at the whims of like commissioners and people telling you what you can That's and can't it. put out there. So I think it's the freedom and it's the accessibility and it's the fact that anybody in the world can make content for anybody in the world. You know, I made a film called Queen of Birds on YouTube, which is about the Philippine Eagle. It was way too conservation heavy to be a film that they would put out on television easily. But, you know, that's been viewed now nearly two million times primarily by people in the Philippines because they're learning about their eagle through a story and I think that is what's so powerful about it you can make a story anywhere in the world and it can fill and a fit to an audience anywhere in the world and that's what's mm -hmm. so special about the internet and digital media yeah exactly democratizes the entire thing and it doesn't limit it to only us it doesn't limit it to the people in the industry or wanting to get into the industry it opens it up to conservationists educationists people who want to make content like you said for their own audiences that can be anywhere so I think it's something that has become so easy now that it really needs to be used more. And uh, it's very effective. It's sometimes way more effective than television. Way more effective. Yeah. Those BBC Earth so, videos, they get like 45 yeah. million views. Exactly. Um, like yeah, I, I worked on a show. BBC Digital had one. It was like 40 million in the first week or something he, he made. And he was like, this, is, yeah. this has had more views than the show has in any exactly <laughs> it's the clips right like i worked on a show and that show's kind of got like on it was on india cross country india and that show's kind of got lost now it was a few years ago but there's a clip like a whole like a little segment from that show that went on youtube and that has millions of views because it's on youtube uh, whereas the rest of the show is like you know it's history now so uh, it's just a very powerful platform and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so. I think it, it really lends into that idea that we were talking about before, which is that um, that way you tell stories and the way different people tap into different sources of telling stories. And, you know, if we talk about how people for a lot of time used to think that books and reading were the only ways that you could consume a lot of the information um, that we put out. And now films and movies have become this really great source of information. Social media is astoundingly useful and so mm -hmm. cool in that aspect. I think TikTok is probably one of the best apps I've ever seen in my life. It's so, it's incredible because there's so many talented, amazing people on there. And it's this, you know, it's this boiling pot of completely different people of completely different ages, completely different skill sets. And everyone's on there doing their own thing. And people are getting this information in bite-sized chunks. And that's so, so useful. Because I think a lot of the time as well, especially in the world we're living in now, where everything's so fast all the time and everyone's, you know, everyone's working. There are a lot of things that lots of people need to do in the day. And whilst I don't believe it should be like that, it is like that. And it so if like you that. work, you know, if you work with the tools yeah. that you're given, then you have this incredible resource, which is TikTok. And a wildlife TikTok is so amazing. I've learned so much about marine biology that I never learned on my course at, uh, at uni. Yeah, and it's, it's so true. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing yeah. because people learn so much. And I think that, like um, you were saying, Dan and Ash, is it's that accessibility factor. It's the factor that um, a lot of the time commissioners will, you know, and working in development, you see this, a lot of the time they'll shoot down a lot of ideas, which... Are quite good ideas but they do understand that they're not really going to get viewed if they're put on the platform that they're that we're commissioning things to and we're pitching things to and that means that they're probably not if they're not going to be seen there's no use in putting that idea into that program or that show anyway yeah. because no one's going to learn anything but what you should be doing as well is taking those ideas and putting them on other platforms that people can access and people will look at like youtube like tiktok because yeah. it's just you know it's just amazing the outreach is also incredibly important and I think for me as well social media has been particularly important because pretty much all of the jobs that I now have have been gotten through social media 
a you lot. You got your BBC job through Twitter, didn't you? I did. Yeah, <laughs> my um, I got my um, BBC job through Twitter um, and also through basically fangirling about Spring Watch. But um, yeah, but basically, I got my BBC job through Twitter, and all of the other jobs that I've gotten have been through this collation of social media, where I've basically had to build a profile, build a brand, and build content and network via social media. And you do that via um, Instagram, you do that via YouTube, you do that via TikTok, you do that by Twitter. It's it's just incredibly useful, I think. And I think the more use we make as filmmakers of social media and of mass media and different platforms to do different things on and to spread information, the more information will get to the right people. And that doesn't necessarily mean there'll be rich people, influential people, or people who are in the top 1% of anything. Yeah. That won't necessarily mean that. In fact, it probably won't mean that at all. But it will mean that it gets to people who will actually need to know this information. And that lends into this idea that the population is learning more about things and knowing how to do more about things in this um, age of society. I think there's definitely something in that, isn't there, about the fact that like impact campaigns and digital media campaigns like what Freeborn Media are doing with CR mm -hmm. Future, like what Nicola Brown and Annie Moyer have done in the past, well Nicola for Our Blue Planet. Mm -hmm. um, I think those digital campaigns that kind of not only massively help the actual show themselves and you know get people's eyes on the content and get them to watch the final show, but it's like if we're like living in a world now where we're trying to make you know, we're actively trying to get people to make changes, to do things before, you know, we get to the point where the climate crisis is going to cause in incredible damage to absolutely everybody on the planet more than it already is going to. Um, we've got to engage the digital landscape. And that is where young people are sitting, you know. So I think that is in, in, our, in the like main point of this conversation about, you know, engaging younger audiences. I think it always has to go back to ending at digital because young people consume media in places that you know the older generations don't uh, how many people do we know nowadays and who are younger who have a tv license probably not very many i know it's that it's, it's uh, people don't engage content that way do you not have one yeah i don't have one um but like you I think that's interesting. Yeah, it's always yeah, it's digital. How to engage people and get TikTok. I should get TikTok. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like an approachable, quick, on-demand way to communicate science and stories. And then through that learning and through that, like, oh, that's really cool. I watched a fifteen-second whatever. It can then lead on to that further connection and learning. It's almost that mm. it, it's the essence of that inspiration, isn't it? Just that little grab. And as as you both said, it's where. Um, the younger generation are consuming media now rather than on, on television like lots of people used to. Um, so kind of on that point, what kind of species get the best engagement? Is it the snails or the birds that you might find in the garden? Um, or is it the, you know, the fastest, strongest, deadliest? What excites these younger audiences? Are we going to have to battle on this? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> I would, I would argue. Sorry about my connection. That's okay, Ash. We, were, I was just asking, um, what kind of species uh, get gets that that engagement? What excites young audiences? Is it some stuff that they can find in in their own back garden, or is it the stuff with teeth and claws, basically? Start with a local um, inspiration, yeah. find the bugs, and end on snow leopards and tigers. I tell you, it's just, I think it's a matter of the storytelling. I don't know why this is such a, such, such a conversation. I completely differ from the industry largely on this because I don't think it's only the cute and the dangerous that engage young audiences. I think it's how the story is told and who tells the story. So I'm going to come back to a classic here. I am going to come back to Sir David. If he tells us about plants, we listen. If he tells us about polar bears, we listen. So it depends. It actually depends on how that story is being told in terms of, you know, how that's packaged, whether that's a really exciting story about a frog or if it's a big animal and who's telling that story, whether that person is being able to command that sort of attention. So I really don't think it comes down to the species as much as it comes down to what I just said. And I think it's an easy way out that we tend to take largely because for commercial reasons, certain things are box office and they sell. That's the bottom line. So big and fluffy sells, cute sells, dangerous sells. So many of many, many shows obviously take that easy way out. But 
if we did decide to sort of give attention to the creepy crawlies, as we put it, or the smaller creatures or the underdogs of nature, I think those shows can be fantastic. And many shows out there prove that it can be fantastic. That's mm -hmm. the power of presenter, isn't it? That's the power of like yeah. a really like engaged of... and passionate. That's why I think it's so it's so great when you see people like David Attenborough, people like yourself, people who've had lifelong and passion. And you, Dan. I mean, if you're going to be super excited about something tiny, I'm going to be super excited about that's it. it. Isn't it? Maybe, maybe, like, maybe in the big contagious. blue chip show. Your energy is contagious. Exactly. Yeah, it. So it, maybe in the big blue just, chip show, yeah, like yeah. an elephant, no one's going to like, yeah, everyone's going to love the elephant. But maybe in a blue chip show where there's no presenter, like a cricket Different. might not get, I mean, maybe will. I'm not, you know, let's see it. So there's a big, <laughs> cricket, but an amazing presenter like David, for example, like you could be, and as, as long as that passion is truly there about the natural world and you can, I think you can get to anyone with anything. Mm -hmm. I think exactly, it's, I agree. It's literally that because I think what's happened is for a long, long time, certain animals, um, like you two have basically touched on already, certain animals have been pushed as these, you know, trophy animals that everyone puts to the forefront whenever you want to make a big program about something. And everyone wants those animals because all we've watched are those animals. So all we know to be excited about are those types of animals and that type of, you know, that type of film, that type of documentary. And so if we're now shown different things, of course, there's going to be a bit of a drop in terms of viewership. There's going to be a drop in terms of who okay. watched it because no one's used to that yet. And that is that change that for a long time, I think has limited a lot of the wildlife television yes, media. Yes, 100%. They're terrified of change and they're always terrified of change. You know, even it's, with the it's a commercial, thing. It's a commercial uh, decision. Exactly. That's more or less what it is, bottom line. It's not like the makers don't want to make it. Yeah, exactly. It's not like, it's, it's a commercial decision that's usually taken, but mm -hmm. it's unfortunate because I, it can have such fantastic potential if it's, if it's sort of, if it's packaged in the right way, if you know what Yeah, I mean. exactly. <laughs> even with, you know, even when you're talking yeah. about um, conservation and people, a lot of programs have, you know, have never been made in the past that are being made now about wildlife and people together because yeah. they were never thought that they would ever get off the ground. It was never thought that people would actually view them. And a lot of the time, this is the problem because we can't be looking at it yeah. from an economy or money standard because you're never going to make any new exactly. content because the progress won't be there because you're not taking any risks. I think that that is the main point. It is about risks. And I would argue that, you know, creepy crawlies, um, as they're badly called because they're not creepy. Um, crawlies, insects, <laughs> nature. Cutie yeah. crawlies. On this. Okay. All insects are pretty. Centipedes are a bit horrible though. <laughs> yeah. Centipedes are amazing. Yeah. What are you talking about? Amazing. Uh, okay. Amazing. It's like Harry Potter. Terrible. Great. Oh my god. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> the, the basically <laughs> the the fact is that I think now people are learning that so many more things can be so much more than cute, cuddly, or exciting. There's so many more multifaceted views that we can have on animals and wildlife and conservation. And there's this really cool, um, this really cool thing that I heard from someone recently, which is you don't have to care about an animal to learn about it or save it or be interested in it. And that's really interesting because it's about splitting apart this idea of really caring and linking your, your love of an animal with being interested and in learning about it. Because actually, a lot of there are some animals which I don't love. I don't love them. I'm not um, linked to them directly in terms of how I feel about them. But I'm still interested in the processes that they go through in life. I'm still interested in the effects they have on the environment. And I think if we can kind of split apart this idea that you have to be entertained by every single animal that comes on TV, you have to love every single animal that comes on TV, we can then provide so much more content because everyone will want to watch certain animals because they're interested and because that piques their interest in a certain process, that piques their interest in a certain life cycle. And I think with insects, especially, we've seen such precious little content in terms of any sort of program mm -hmm. that's come out about wildlife in terms of undergrowth, insects. You know, I think the last big program that I remember is Life in the Undergrowth by David Attenborough. And that was- Yeah, it was fantastic. I loved it. It was incredible. Yeah, and I loved it. It, it was, was absolutely incredible. incredible. So memorable. Yeah, and the, the only reason I think that, you know, it hasn't been made since is because people, they're terrified of putting anyone else fronting that because they don't think it will sell because there's no David Attenborough. <laughs> and you kind yeah. of have to look more at the insects and less at David Attenborough because, you know, these are fascinating creatures and a lot of people would be very interested to learn more about them, but you have to push the boat out on it a bit. You should front it, Darwood. 
I mean, um, you're like, I, think so. I would like to do that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, are, are there any yeah this is actually a pitch for me. <laughs> are there any, um, obviously you've mentioned the undergrowth um, and Dan has mentioned Planet Defenders. Have you got any examples of films um, to watch or to draw inspiration from? I know that here at uh, the Wild Screen team, we loved A Bee's Diary, which premiered in tw at the 2020 festival. It was so approachable and I've, I've recommended it to my mum and she loved it and I've recommended it to my niece and she loved it too. Are there any films or you know TV shows for you that people could watch as inspiration to make their own content for younger audiences? I would say, like, if it's if we're, to, if we're talking to, you know, people who are coming into the industry, people who are thinking about making their own short films, I think, like, instead of looking necessarily totally at, like, highly produced, you know, funded programmes that are on television, have a look at the kinds of things that your peers are creating. There's a fantastic film called A Voice Above Nature, made by a filmmaker called Annie Moyer, where there is actually no music in the whole film. She's made this film with the sounds of whales and the sounds of boats traveling across the ocean um, to tell the story of noise okay. pollution in the oceans. Um, and she made that film in her, in her master's um, degree. And it was the first film that she'd ever made. And I think by looking at that sort of content, um, you can kind of really understand the process about how people how people go through it and really that that film's fuel was Annie's unbelievable passion for the ocean especially related to sound pollution a conversation lots of people hadn't been having um and it was an official selection for wild screen um a couple of years ago now so that, yeah. that's a really brilliant one and there's so many more also come to Wilderland Film Festival touring in autumn where we will be showcasing <laughs> wonderful short films made by independent filmmakers all over the world a shameless plug yeah, yeah but, <laughs> that's actually a really great way of learning because right at the beginning i used to do that quite a lot i used to go through the wild lists of nominees i used to go through all the different festival lists of nominees and what i used to come across exactly what you're saying which is the content from independent filmmakers who doesn't necessarily get on get green or get on uh, netflix or any channels and stuff like that. but they are oh the rain got her again. Yeah. Got her. She was trying so hard there, and then it was like, no. <laughs> while while we wait for her, I will put a plug in for My Garden of a Thousand Bees, which I think is one of the best documentaries I have ever seen in my life, and it is absolutely incredible. It's so beautiful <laughs> because it is it is all about bees, but it's about this tiny section of green. It's just about the back garden of I think Martin Dawn is the person who um, made the film, and it is just him with a selection of cameras and a selection of different types of bumblebees and bee species in his back garden in Bristol. And he's filming them over lockdown and he's filming them with different cameras from different perspectives because there are bees that are, you know, in, in um, size comparison, they're about this big compared to this big. There's so many different types. There's so many different perspectives that he explores. And I think what that really does is it shows you it shows you the wildlife on your doorstep, but it also shows you how, if you literally just look closer, there's so much life there. And I think that was a really interesting, a very useful documentary actually. And one that every single time I go to anything and people ask, oh, what are you doing? Um, what, what are you watching nowadays? I would always, always say uh, My Garden of a Thousand Bees. And also My Octopus Teacher, which um, I did a review for and is one of my favorite documentaries ever to exist as well. Um, that, again, is this idea that you can spin an entirely different idea and an entire, entirely different perspective on wildlife because it's about that personal relationship um, that the filmmaker has with the octopus. And, you know, that really flips your perspective on wildlife documentaries because it was very emotional. It was very, um, it was very much influenced by emotion and by love. And that's not something that I see in a lot of documentaries. And even though I've said that you don't have to love an animal to see it on screen, with that one, you kind of do. And that's, uh, you know, it, it, it humanizes an animal that people I don't think often humanize a lot. And I think have very much understated in terms of how intelligent um, and how influential it's been for ocean uh, conservation. Hmm, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think Ash is back and she can hear us, but um, I hope so. But um, I, that actually- um, I, It's my video. Ash, oh, there we go, perfect. Can you still hear us, Ash? I got her again. 
came back um, cruel rain. Cruel, I think cruel rain. I think your point there, Darwood, actually uh, leads really nicely onto one of the questions that we've had into the Q and A box here. Um, so someone has asked, do you think uh, anthropomorphism is a problem or a benefit within content for younger audiences? That kind of connection on an emotional level. Um, it'd be great to hear both of your thoughts on that. I think both. I think um, on one hand, it's become quite um, it's become quite a negative thing because uh, you know we only look at animals that we can relate to, and of course, with any experience and any sort of um, any sort of program that you watch and anything that you consume, the things that you're going to relate to are things that you've experienced because we can only really relate to things that we've experienced, and so we're going to relate to animals um, in a way that we we relate to ourselves and we reflect on ourselves and we see ourselves in those animals. It's why we love dogs so much. You know, it's why we love pets so much. And there's, it's actually an issue that's come about when I've written articles before um, and spoken to people about wildlife and animal communication. Um, and especially this idea that when we communicate with animals, what we're doing really, and what we've done for the last few years is communicate um, to them from a perspective that's our own. And we're trying to communicate to them from the point of view of, huma of humans and humanity. And this idea of anthropomorphizing um, wildlife in documentaries is what's led to this idea that we can only conserve animals that are that look like humans, that have an expression, that can smile, that can do this and that, that, can, that we can talk to, that we can talk about in a way that would suggest that they are people. And then we come into this idea of hierarchy and this idea that people are higher than animals because the only animals that we protect and the only animals that we look at to conserve are the animals that we relate to as humans, which means that subconsciously we're basically saying that humans are better than all animals and the only, you know, the only things that are worth saving are humans and stuff that looks or acts like humans. And so it has been quite negative in that aspect, but I think it can be spun in a positive light because I think what we can do is use that anthropomorphizing, um, if I'm saying the word right, use that power to then make the animals that we don't, we didn't often see before as being cute, cuddly, emotive in any way. We can make them emotive because we can look at animals like bees, for example, and I'm going to keep going back to bees and insects because that's kind of what I do. But um, you know, if we even if we look at spiders, these animals that people have seen for so long as creepy, as scary, as really dangerous, horrible creatures. There are recent videos, and um, this is on TikTok that I found this, there's videos of people training jumping spiders. And there's these close up, very clear, beautiful films about jumping spiders. And they're having emotions and reactions that are similar to cats or they're similar to people or that, you know, but it's the way they've been framed. It's not that they're now being trained to act like people. It's the fact that it's been framed in a light that you're anthropomorphizing spiders. And so that can be used in a positive light because now we're using what was negative before to actually conserve multiple other animals because we're exploring different perspectives through the eye of humanity. And that also helps us as humans, I think, because it allows us to see what different types of people there are because people are so much more than what we thought of before. So how can you really anthropomorphize an animal in one way if human beings are so much more than one thing? Mm. I literally could not agree more. There is nothing I would add to that other than, um, <laughs> yeah, it got a bad rep through, um, so many people in our industry have come through um, scientific study. Uh, not every, every, all of them. And actually, I think there's such an unbelievable value in coming into this industry without scientific study and coming from different backgrounds, because that is so important to storytelling. Because as we have know, and as you spoke about earlier, Darwood, it's so important to have different perspectives across the board. But I will say that yeah, those um, anthropomorph anthropomorphizing animals, I think is a power that film has that um, science doesn't have so much. Um, that means that we can like access emotional uh, reactions to animals we otherwise wouldn't be able to so easily. And it makes people care about them in ways they otherwise wouldn't like the jumping spider. So yeah, totally, totally agree. So we've, we've had a few questions um, in the Q&A box about getting started um, and get, getting jobs. So what would be your top tips for someone wanting to approach a project that seeks to inspire and engage, whether they're just starting out, whether they've come through that scientific background or not, how can they get involved and what are the first steps? 
Well, I'll go from an education point of view, because um, I, I did a master's in wildlife film production after studying zoology. So I, I yeah, I, I did this kind of typical, I would say m more typical route into wildlife film in that I studied zoology at university. I went to the University of Sheffield. Um, I then worked as a biologist um, in a number of different places prior to getting into film. I, I started making my own kind of like, like short films, not very good ones, um, uh, and then, did a master's in wildlife filmmaking in Bristol, which is a fantastic hub for the wildlife film community. And I think it's such a great place to start out. Not 100% necessary in any form whatsoever, especially with the advent of everybody speaking on Zoom and having Zoom meetings, but it is a really good place just for community in terms of meeting people. It's really good. There's lots of events that are made by Wild Screen Network, for example, getting people involved. So there is that it's a really great hub for the industry. But yeah, the master's I did was based here uh, and it kind of taught us um, a kind of whistle-stop tour of the entire industry. We got loads of great access, fantastic teaching, um, access to the BBC Natural History Unit and producers there, um, each being partnered with one person on the course. So I would say um, that is a really good route in. Um, and also the best thing about that master's programme, in my opinion, is that it does not uh, require somebody to come from any specific kind of background or have any kind of educational background. It is actually... Um, it is it's good to come from a different perspective and 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 everybody who comes onto that master's course has such a different diverse uh, background um whether it's like mass communications as Catalina Rissisabal who now works at the BBC had to a zoology background like myself or a photography background like Tom Campbell who's now a camera operator um so I think yeah there's loads of different opportunities and also I will say I'd like while I while I'm, I'm talking about it that actually the industry isn't super hard to get into I think it's like the most important thing is natural is a passion to do it. And I think if someone really genuinely really wants to be a wildlife filmmaker in any capacity, whether that's a presenter, researcher, it's a producer or anything, anybody can do it. It's about the passion. The industry is very welcoming. Um, and uh, I think it's reaching out to people is the most important thing um, because people um, actually are really responsive and want to talk to people. And yeah, would you guys add anything to that? Yeah, 100%. And I, I mean, I don't come from a science background at all, actually. I come from a literature background. So my undergrad was in English literature. So um, I, I don't at all come from a STEM background. And in a weird way, that actually, uh, I won't say it helped, but it didn't disadvantage me. Because as Dal was saying right at the beginning of this, was uh, we tend to use a lot of jargon and complicate things. I automatically tried to simplify it because I could, couldn't get it. So I was like trying to simplify stuff to write it to start going with what's going on. So I had a massive passion and a massive interest in the subject. So automatically, I was sort of reading a lot and trying to get it. And at the same time, trying to simplify it for myself and therefore the audience. So it doesn't actually, that's the best part about this industry from what I've noticed over the years is I've met people who have no degrees, who've come from arts, who've come from pure science backgrounds, who've come from film backgrounds. And there's just a whole lot of people who come from all kinds of backgrounds into this industry. And the one thing that they share and the one thing that helps them stand out and succeed, as you very rightly said, is that passion and that like absolutely insatiable need to learn and grow. So that's what you really need. And just reach out to people. And I think that's a great start. And of course, after my degree, I finally, my post-graduation, I, I also did the same degree that you did, but from New Zealand, which is the other course. And um, yeah, and that was, that was fantastic. But I did that at a slightly later stage once I was 100% sure this is what I was cut out to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's probably uh, what I would also advise is to sort of step into the industry for a bit, uh, gather that experience, see if you're cut out for it, so you really love it. And then maybe you can make that big commitment of doing a master in the subject um uh in one of the uh, uh programs and i believe you you uh w is one of the best right now so that would definitely be awesome there's also one up in salford that erin rainey who was another pa planet offender uh planet defender did um yeah. which is a fantastic course as well so yeah oh and also in london there's a uh, yeah, three uh, or four exactly three or four now yeah 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 absolutely interesting because i so i didn't do um masters in anything um my bachelor's was in marine biology um and then from there i um i basically went on to do to work at the bbc as a researcher and i think 
the reason so a lot of people kind of talk to me about it and they're kind of perplexed because it is you know it's this case of me being someone who didn't do a master's in wildlife filmmaking but I did look into it and it was something that I had potentially looked into doing and I had wanted to do a master's in something but when I talked to um the talent executive at the BBC they suggested that I don't do one um not necessary at all um, some of the experience I had before and that we come to this I think this interesting crossroads where a lot of the time um people think they have to do something to get somewhere yeah. and they don't need to so whilst a master's is really useful and you know it's incredibly useful to a lot of people um and I think with with you guys you you know you've learned so much from it and part of me still wishes that I kind of did one but it, the reality I think is that the fact that I had the passion before and I was doing stuff like journalism alongside my degree and writing for various places and doing that storytelling and had been doing it since I was quite young and kind of making little films and doing that kind of that work alongside that meant that I was qualified for that. And I think what we then need to tell people is that, you know, a master's um, and any sort of practical knowledge or um, activities or skills that you get these are kind of the same things if you boil them down. Exactly. Their basics. Yeah. A master's is there to prop up your knowledge. It's there to help you learn new skills. But you can do that without a master's. And you can do that just by going out into the world and gaining practical skills. But there is this idea of privilege, which, you know, you need to kind of look upon, which is this idea, I think, that whilst everyone actually has the same level of um, skill, I think, in them, whilst everyone has the same level of potential in them, the only people who are going to get to certain levels, um, for example, becoming broadcasters, wildlife filmmakers, researchers, are the people who are given tools to nurture those skills and the, um, the potential yeah. that they already have in them. And so then we kind of need to look into how accessible these tools are to different people, because, you know, everyone, everyone can do it, but some people can't. And I know that sounds a bit weird to say that because it, it sounds a bit rubbish, but everyone has the potential to do things, but certain people won't be allowed certain opportunities because of the, the tools that they aren't given um, for certain jobs, for example. And so I think, you know, it's really useful to look at the passion that you have. And yeah. I think networking is an extremely useful skill to have in this industry. It's the one that's probably helped me the most in terms of getting any sort of job or opportunity is that it's the networking, it is who you know. And I think that it's becoming easier in terms of how accessible people are. I think, you know, after I've done events where I talk about certain practices in wildlife film, um, I am available to email. And that's something that, you know, sometimes people may not think they may not think that people are available to email. And it's like you said, Dan, a lot of people are actually willing to reach out, but people don't know that because of how the industry has been framed, where it is, it's framed as something that's quite hard to get into when in reality, you know, they want more people. They want more people to get, to come in. They want people with new, fresh perspectives. And I think telling people that is very useful because then people will reach yeah, out. Yeah, hundred percent. People exactly, like- Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think absolutely it was so overwhelming for me when I like first initial, you know, when I was just joining the industry, because you kind of felt like everybody was out of reach and oh my God, they're like producers and series producers and oh my God, I can't talk to these people. But yeah. people are people, they're lovely human beings. So once you start talking to them, you're like, okay, this is not quite as scary as I thought it was. Exactly, they're yeah. being very nice. So, so yeah, I think it's just a matter of sort of you know, just start talking. I mean, you never know what leads to, you'll be surprised how many people sort of start championing you one by, you know, one after the other. It's not going to be everyone, of course not. But people are going to help. They're very, very helpful within this industry. And I can, I, I can definitely say that from my own experience. So yeah. Also with kind of, um, you know, everyone, a lot of people nowadays have access to amazing cameras in their phones. So a first step yeah. is go out, find something and hit record and see mm -hmm. where it takes you. We've spoken about yeah. YouTube today and TikTok. All of those platforms are accessible and free and it, it, really, it can really help to inspire passion, can't it? Mm -hmm. 100%. But um, I would just like to say a massive thank you to you all. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. So Ash, Dawa, Dan, a huge thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure uh, to have you and such an insightful conversation. We've had some amazing comments in the chat. Thank you as well for everyone for joining us this afternoon. We hope that everybody enjoyed. We've actually had lots of questions about uh, telling local stories come in. 
uh, how local stories can be passion projects, how to get involved in local storytelling. So make sure you tune into our other free webinars. The next in the series is next Wednesday, the 18th of May, uh, and we'll be focused on hyper-local storytelling. Lara, our Wild Screen Network Manager, will be joined by Natalie Clements, Laura Panafort, and Will Cossier. Uh, so register your, for your free tickets on the Wild Screen Eventbrite page. Uh, we're also hosting a coffee morning speaking of networking <laughs> um, in the Bristol Beacon on Thursday. So if you're in the area, please do come down and say hello. Um, uh, we'll pop the link in, in an email to follow up after this uh, as well. Um, and lastly, uh, a plug on our side, we are currently conducting a UK-wide survey. So if you're in the UK and you're a freelancer, please head to our socials or website to find out more. Uh, and to add your voice to this important piece of research to help us basically map the natural history and film and TV industry. Uh, as I said, we'll send all of this over in a follow-up email to you too if you'd like to check any of it out. But for now, thank you all for joining. Uh, I hope you have a lovely week and hopefully see you on Thursday. <laughs>